Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry, a history teacher, and today we got another video from Chat History, and it's titled, Small Mistakes in History That Caused Huge Disasters. I love these type of discussions, because sometimes what seems like small actions can indeed completely change the course of history. So I'm excited to see what list they got here. I'm gonna give you my takes. Now this video will be linked down below. Please support Chat History. Give them a sub if you like this original video, and be sure to sub over here if you haven't. Big shout out to the current Patreon and YouTube channel members right now. I really appreciate the additional support you're giving. All right, let's get started. All right, so what are some of the events you think that were small mistakes that caused disasters? I know just a second ago I was saying how small you know things can cause big effects in history, but ones that cause disasters, man. Let's see what they got. Hey guys, today hey. we're gonna see how some small mistakes in history led to some pretty big consequences. What do we got? So strap in with your favorite toothpaste and orange juice, cause I hate go. that feeling. I hate that feeling. Wait, Scotland's golden age ended because of a booty call? Oh God. You know, you know, you never think of like the Scottish golden age. You know, you think of like Greece's golden age or China's golden age, the Islamic golden age. <laughs> the Scottish? King of Scots, Alexander III was revered by his subjects as a kind and noble king, so he was a pretty cool guy. He put an end to an ongoing war with Norway with the signing of the Treaty of Perth. This stopped the invading Vikings from stop doing the Vikings, their stereotypical man. graping and pillaging and made them frig off back to Norway. <laughs> hey, you can be like the English and just lose your whole country to them. Good job, Scotland. The treaty also let Scotland gain possession of the Western Isles and the Isle of Man. With all this land expansion going on, as well as increased exports and cash flow, More of those Scotland crappy entered islands a over there. golden age. No offense. Everything was pretty good until it wasn't. After all, no story is complete without some good old-fashioned character development from a Disney Pixar family tragedy. In the mid-1280s, <laughs> King Alexander's <laughs> wife, Queen Margaret, bit the dust, which was Rip. pretty devastating since they were married since childhood. Well, at least he had his own children to care That's for. That's how it was back in those Except days, Except for guys. the fact that they all died too. Little Margaret Jr., who hilariously became Queen of Norway, expired at the age of 22 while pooping out her only child, a daughter named Margaret. We call it giving birth, not pooping out. It's a whole different process, okay? By the way, very common to, I don't care if you were king, if you're an elite, to lose a lot of children in childbirth. You're probably gonna lose a quarter of them uh, just in childbirth, and then you're hoping half of them live to adolescence. We'll get to her later. Alex Jr. died on his 20th birthday at the age of That's 20. Him? Don't know how he died either. Sources just say he just died. That's what I'm saying. The like, child you just, stuff happens. <laughs> you get ailments, you can get an injury that can turn into an infection. You know, there's so many things like that. Things that we take for granted for today that are just like easy, common things that we can treat. Not back then, sometimes you just die. <laughs> While David also kicked an uneventful bucket at age 19. With his family tree essentially trimmed down to the trunk, Alex was desperate to generate new successors. So he What's married a eye? French countess, Yolanda of Drew. Okay. She moved in with the king, but like in a different, Yolanda, for some reason. Well, Yolanda of Drew Dernal. One night, the king was acting pretty eager to uh, perform, so he set out to do the deed of sowing his seed, and nothing was going to block his urge to splurge. Nope, not even that. Despite pleads and warnings from bro code breaking advisors, the king set out to get his dunk sunk. He had a few of his servants accompany him as guides, and they made it to the queen, but the king on the other hand, got separated in the harsh storm and was subsequently yeeted off of his horse over a cliff where he was found the next morning. Dead as a doornail. With no other heir, it was Margaret Jr. Jr.'s time to shine. But since she was only three years old and with the attention span of a yeah, goldfish, the political landscape of Scotland fell into ruin. See, this is this happens. This happens. This is one of the biggest flaws, although there are many flaws that can be in monarchy, but it's what happens when you haven't truly groomed the successor into adulthood to be the one to take over the crown, right? You have a three-year-old. Now, obviously a three-year-old can't run the country. So what do you get? A power vacuum. All of a sudden you get the other siblings, you get advisors. This is when if you are somebody that wasn't from the royal family and you're hoping to get a piece right now, this is where you step in. Okay, this would happen with every like dynasty happened in China. It's gonna happen in the Romans. It's like somebody can step in and you can claim a new dynasty here. Because yeah, I mean, even if you did choose somebody to be like, all right, you're gonna rule for the next like 15 years, right? Before the 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 kid is going to be of age. It's like that person's gonna be like, all right, you know what? I'll just give up that power when it's time. Doesn't happen. Ending the short-lived <laughs> golden age. All because the king needed to slam some sweet queen's skush. I mean, he's, 
he was, he was literally looking out to to keep the empire going. I mean, you had a new why. I mean, was, you get it. All right, lost key, Dune the Titanic. Really? Okay, okay, okay. Something to do with the iceberg. I mean, how are they going to do this? Someone going to get sure the, you know, the news the earlier. The luxurious ocean liner Titanic was the ship of dreams that ended up becoming a complete night. Shout out the, uh, the, the Majora's Mask moon in the top left there, creeping up. Mare. The ship died in 1912 it after died. Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Ships Winslet distracted the two lookouts in the crow's That's nest true. from observing the giant fucking iceberg true floating story. several hundred feet in front of them. True Despite story. the crew's best efforts, the ship collided with the iceberg. And Jack could have survived. Go ahead and look at the film again. That, that, that piece of wood that Rose was on. Jack could have fit. She killed him. He got flushed into the North Atlantic a few hours later. <laughs> Joking aside, mm -hmm. it is believed that the entire disaster could have been prevented or at least significantly reduced if it weren't for one key mistake, an actual missing key. Lookouts Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee were I tasked with the important task of making sure that no icebergs were in the ship's path. His in the crow's Fleet? nest, the two men were equipped with a warning bell and a telephone to alert crew of any potential dangers in the chilled water so no one was up there. They also had one more tool, a pair of binoculars which were secured in a box, a locked box with a missing key. Ah. Apparently, this key was accidentally taken off of the ship before it set sail by a second officer, David Blair. David! What's this, uh, what's this here in my pocket? What the? Huh. Your eh, fault. I'm sure that's not a big deal. Oh With my no gosh. With no binoculars, the lookouts had to rely on eyesight alone. And that wouldn't be so terrible if it weren't for the fact that the was night dark. was extremely dark, yeah, it was cold, dark. and calm. Making it very hard. Um, anyone know if it was like a full moon or anything either? Was there sight? Could someone look at what the phase of the moon was? Back in, uh, <laughs> back on this night. ...to see icebergs. Luckily, there were almost none all night. Almost. Both lookouts miraculously survived the sinking and, when interviewed, agreed that if they had binoculars, they could have seen the iceberg and reacted Should've gone down quickly, with the ship. ...avoiding the unnecessary loss of over 1,500 lives, but dooming James Cameron's film career. Yeah, true. The key, donated to the British Sailor Society by Officer Blair's daughter, what? was eventually sold at auction for 90,000 British pounds. The thing, the key that maybe could have saved it. So, I don't know, I mean, how, how much how big of an impact would it have made? You like the Titanic. I know that's got to be hard to like maneuver and stuff. Would they have had enough time? I mean, I guess it's like, why would they even have that if they didn't? All right. Pirates prevented the metric system in the US. It was pirates. Dude, I just thought we wanted to roll our own way. Imperial system. If you've ever dealt with the trouble of remembering how it many tablespoons no sense, are in a gallon or that there's 660 feet in a furlong, you probably long for the ease of the metric system. Being an American myself, I'm it's genetically true. inclined to detest the anti-freedom units, but getting an engineering <laughs> degree made me appreciate Freedom. the simplicity of the metric system. I, I mean, guys, it's, it's, it's really great. Everything is just a multiplicative of 10. Kilogram? It's a thousand grams. A meter? It's a hundred centimeters. It's consistent. Like, wow, amazing. It's consistent. Anyway, that convenience... It's like our language, English, is a big mutt of a bunch of a language. There's so many exceptions to so many rules and stuff like that. So why not our, you know, our whole measurement system? And forget that everyone else pretty much in the, the world uses it, unless you're at some kind of uh, protectorate of the United States, like Liberia or something like that. But, you know, Stolen from us by a band of scallywag pirates during America's infancy. In 1793, Secretary of State Thomas Mother F. And Jefferson <laughs> recognized that the United States needed to standardize their units of measure as <laughs> Frank, multiple systems like, were being used. Adams is a, making commercial even, trading... Yeah, let's just look at this picture here. Okay, I think about Adams. He's in the middle. He's like just staring off into the distance. Franklin is like... Or uh, uh, Franklin, yeah, I mean, he's doing his thing with his dumb glasses stuff. But yeah, this is just, this is fantastic. Standardized their units of measure as multiple systems were being used, making commercial trading a logistical nightmare. Luckily, the French of all people had an answer. Scientist Joseph Dombey was dispatched to the United States with a special gift, a carefully crafted copper cylinder, which would serve as the revolutionary new standard in weight measurement, the kilogram. Okay. Just one component of France's newly so developed like the metric. OG, the OG kilogram. So everything's only based off this weight right here. Now we just got to divide it up and, you know, do all that. I mean, yeah, you just look, look at this. It just it makes sense, right? Okay, where did the pirates come in? What did Johnny Depp do? to make this so dang complicated. System. While sailing to the States with his cylinder in one hand and the kilogram in the other, Dombey's ship was blown off course by a storm. Oh, <laughs> they had it. The, the unit of measurement. Now headed for the 1700s Caribbean. 
British pirates at the time usually attacked non-British ships to impede their trade and unfortunately Don Bay was one of those victims. He was held hostage for ransom but died in captivity. Don Bay's death meant that no. Jefferson never got the metric standard, meaning it was never adopted. So the United States stuck with the English units as their standard. <laughs> we gave up so easy. <laughs> like, send another one eventually. It sounds like we never really wanted to anyways. We would have tried a little bit harder to get the unit of measure so we could base it all out. I mean, it sounds more like, a, like an excuse than an explanation. While it is possible that we could all be measuring our all beef francs using centimeters, it's doubtful as multiple attempts over the years to implement the metric system. I'm a have fan of the inches though, because I feel like center, centimeters to meters, I will say, is too big of a jump. Like I like inches and feet. Centimeters to meters is too big of a jump. When we're starting saying like hundreds of centimeters and stuff like that, that's just too many. We need another type of, of thing, but like meter, kilometer, that's good. Grams, milligrams, I think I'm okay with that, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just being crazy. Look at our boy on the right coming at the greasy hand of American pride. What is this comedy? Sh a mistranslated, okay, a mistranslated word started a war. Okay, I've actually heard of a couple things for this. Let's see which one this is. Ethiopia and Italy typically aren't two countries that you would hear about in the same sentence. But during Okay. I mean, y'all are historians. Ethiopia invaded multiple times. Uh, first one sucked uh, during the scramble of Africa for Italy. It was an amazing feat for the Ethiopians. Ethiopia was the only place in Africa that militarily was able to defend itself, and prevent imperialism during the scramble for Africa. That was at the kind of mid to eight, late 1800s, all the way into World War One. Then, of course, Mussolini comes in, brutally comes in um, uh, during in the 1930s. And I uh, was one of the, actually the early real imperialist, imperialist aggressive things that, uh, you know, on the way to to World War Two, that was largely ignored and rather unenforced, you know, with the world there. So they actually have quite a history. During the late 1800s, but, when Africa was getting absolutely reamed by colonization, Italy had its sights set on some potential land expansion candidates. All that stuff there in the east. So why here, um, a couple things, the coastal areas like, like Somalia um, and Eritrea, these are areas that are by the, uh, uh, we're going to be connected um, waterway through the Suez Canal. So having control of that access, so much of the world's exports uh, come through there. So much of all world goods come through that little uh, place. It's one of the most strategically important places still to this day. Yes, even with air travel and stuff, stuff still, you know, shipped by ship because ships can hold so much more stuff than, of course, planes can. One of them being, you guessed it, Eritrea, Ethiopia's northern neighbor. This led to a bit of an unofficial scuffle called the Italo-Ethiopian War of 1887, which lasted for two years and ended with that, Italy though. formally occupying Eritrea and the signing of the Treaty of Wuchal. Among other rules, the treaty basically stated that peace was to remain between Italy and Ethiopia. However, one article had two different meanings between languages. In Italian, the article stated that Ethiopia Skibbity must Bobby act through Italy if they wish to do business with other governments. The Amharic or Ethiopian version stated that Ethiopia can act through Italy for external business, which suggested that it wasn't mandatory. Very different. Look like those weird symbols. The treaty from, was no, nonetheless Pokemon signed, and eventually the two countries clashed. Again. Italy claimed that it had full control over Ethiopia's external affairs, but Ethiopia claimed, nah -uh, dude. Italy then invaded Ethiopia in 1895, starting the official first Italo-Ethiopian War. With Italy's army of 44,000 against Ethiopia's 125,000, the Italians ended up getting their spaghetti-eating teeth kicked in. Yep. See, so they had modernized their military. There was such a big discrepancy in militaries in most of the engagements between European powers and uh, African resistance movements. Some of them were still using, you know, musket technology in Africa. A lot of them that they had gotten and that tech, uh, talking technology from the uh, um, from the slave trade, which you know largely ended by this time. But uh, yeah, he had uh, King Menelik, you know, had had gone um, and really on the offensive there when getting that technology. Uh, you could see here one of the biggest things that calls the Maxim machine gun. This was the most deadly and most basically efficient weapon in all of these wars of imperialism during the scramble of Africa, uh, because there was nothing like it that anyone had really in Africa. Um, 
happens in Asia as well. And uh, it was it was a big tide turner. Um, it wasn't until World War One where you started to see these largely against each other because European nations had it against each other, which of course is a big reason for the stalemate and the deadliness of World War One, which is coming around the corner here. So big shout out to the Ethiopians for. Uh, being able to do this when so many had failed. Securing Ethiopia's independence in 1896, uh, until Italy invaded again in 1935. Bye. Italy won that time. Mussolini. All in all, around 25,000 lives were lost during the first Italo-Ethiopian War, all because Italy decided to skip its daily Duolingo sessions. That second war was way deadlier, by the way. All right, who we got? Stalin's paranoia led to his death. <laughs> But yeah, <laughs> megalomaniacs can do this kind of thing. Uh, the, the the one I always think about, about paranoia leading to your death, uh, was uh, Shiwangi, first emperor of China. The dude took mercury tablets, thinking that they were some elixir to long-lasting life, when in the end it just gave him mercury poisoning and literally destroyed his brain. Dying trying to become immortal. One of the greatest ironies that we see in history. When you're a power hungry dictator to millions of food hungry citizens, your people will probably hate I mean, his you. Paranoia which was is something that Joseph epic. Stalin was shocked to find out when leading the Soviet Union from 1924 until his death in 1953. Solid. Although he Maybe. came into power <laughs> with some strong initial support, it quickly dried up as his first few years sucked eggs. He went balls deep into national industrialization and uprooted the agricultural system. Yep, collectivization, a lot of the stuff, New England uh, the new the New England plan, <laughs> new economic plan, basically all the stuff economically that was, you know, being built from the Lenin era and giving a lot more opportunity, honestly, for people to be able to really, I guess, receive some of the more, a lot more of the fruits of their own labor there was just not done. Um, it was then collectivized. Uh, Stalin creates a command economy, which has now been largely associated with what communism is, is when the government runs stuff, right? When socialism, um, you know, at its uh, uh, original kind of hypothesized form, when you're talking about Karl Marx and things, um, was the workers are in control making the decisions, democratization of the workplace, where in this case, it's the exact opposite. Now you are going to have these workers committees and stuff, but it's still, it's done by a single party state and this collectivization, uh, we've seen this happen. Collectivization also happened in China. And we know that famines also came from these things. There's a lot of factors, of course, that go into this, but um, in the long run, um, it ended up, especially on the, on the uh, industrial front, um, part of what's called Stalin's new five-year or five-year plans ended up um, actually uh, pushing the Soviet Union into basically industrialization in five years to become an industrial world power um, in that, but of course at incredible costs. No food means famine and famine means people die. So people died, millions of them. Stalin was now officially an asshole, and a assholes little more. need to be wiped clean. About that. His Ukraine. political rivals demanded his removal, prompting Stalin to switch to defense mode. In doing so, he began stringent investigations of the government for anyone who purge. might even toy with the idea of questioning his policies. Here's the purge. Yes, hello, I have question. Now, obviously, even if you can't, you came through the whole Lenin pipeline like him and so many of his buddies did. When you start to deviate from that plan. You are going to make enemies. And yeah, he, he had a lot of enemies within his party because he would, did have different outlooks on, on those things. Um, one of the biggest uh, uh, of, of the people that he was very paranoid about, you know, wasn't just the you know Bolshevik party that he grew up with. It was the military. In fact, he ended up purging about half of the military leadership of um, of Russia, of the Soviet Union. And that made them in a very weakened state uh, state by the time, you know, Germany invades Soviet Union in World War II. Rip. All right, so what's the no mistake? No one was safe. During what came to be known as the Great Purge Trotsky. between 1936 and 1938, Stalin expanded his investigations to anyone he deemed a threat to the Soviet Union. By the end, there were over 700,000 documented executions of workers, artists, teachers, whoever. While in reality, it is estimated... Okay. So this is a gun channel, not a gun channel that I'm covering. There's no world where that is proper form to hold a gun, okay? Even that thing's a little pea shooter like it is. This is a dork. This guy is dork maxing right here in the front. This guy needs to be purged. Made it to be about 1.2 million. Even his own Red Army saw 37,000 soldiers executed or sentenced to labor camps. 
And these weren't just lowly foot soldiers either. I'm talking like commanders yes, and generals. Half of the leadership, his, his probably. Top guys. Stalin was absolutely unhinged with his paranoia destroying his mental and physical health. By the way, he knows what it's like to go to one of them Siberian camps. Dude was exiled to Siberia six times in his life. Six and escaped every time. He ended up surviving a severe heart attack and a stroke in 1945, with his health never Avid fully recovering. On the smoker. night of February 28th, 1953, Stalin was chilling with some bros, watching movies and having dinner. After a long night of joking and smooches, Stalin retired to his watching? private quarters, specifically instructing not to be disturbed until he woke up the next morning. Well, the next morning came and nothing. Afternoon, Rip. nothing. Remember that even his closest friends were terrified of defying him lest they be sent to the gulag. Oh, what, Night they could have saved him? Still nothing. And by now, they're pretty worried. It wasn't until 11 p.m. that a housekeeper dared to check on Stalin. He was found on the ground Stalin unconscious son? and unresponsive. Still terrified to call the doctor. He was on the floor. Took... I didn't know this, actually. He was found on the ground unconscious and unresponsive. Still so he got up. He probably was in pain. Got up. A heart attack, whatever. If I had to call the doctor, it took another eight hours for Stalin to receive medical attention. With an extremely high blood pressure of 190 over 110, Stalin had suffered another intense stroke. He received around-the-clock care for three days before he ultimately despawned on March 5th, 1953. <laughs> he ran out of... Had he been kinder to his bros and not such Revives. a complete butthole, he may have been treated sooner and survived <laughs> his ailment, even if it was short-lived. The Soviet Union eventually collapsed in 1991. And there we have it. I mean, you a lot. see how small... <laughs> it's going to be another 40 years, so it's not like that was connected. Well, itty bitty mistakes can lead to some severe consequences. So be sure to never make another mistake in your life. You can start that promise by clicking this to check out more of my content. That's never a mistake. <laughs> Final thoughts. You know, that was super informative. All of those little instances there were not things I knew some of the details about. Like, I know the, all those of like those were like historical events, but getting down to that level that there was something I guess you could tie to like a small mistake having those big effects. That was actually really cool. Hopefully I was able to teach you some history along the way, some of the bigger stuff going on. And hopefully we all learned a lot together there. All right. If you like this video, give it a like um, down below is the original video. If you like that, make sure that you are subbing to chat history, watch their videos. So if I see their videos are doing well and I see them recommended to me, I'm going to cover it more. All right. And with that, we'll see you all next time.